You're listening to the free, ad-sponsored re-release of American Elections Wicked Game, a weekly march through every presidential election from 1789 to 2024. To listen to all episodes right now, ad-free, go to IntoHistory.com. Subscribers there enjoy ad-free listening, early access, bonus content, and more from a growing collection of great history podcasts. Start your free trial today at IntoHistory.com. It's January 1789 at the Hebron Lutheran Church in Culpeper County, Virginia. The ground is covered with 10 inches of snow. With the wind chill, it's well below freezing. But the foul weather hasn't stopped a crowd of hundreds of Lutherans from gathering outside the church. A young man of 21 and his father huddle together and watch as a musician plays a fiddle to entertain the crowd. Yeah, oh, it's freezing out here. Stamp your feet, son. Couldn't they have done the debate inside? The church is no place for politics. What? <laughs> Neither's the snow. The young man blows in his hands to try and stay warm. <sighs> Who will you vote for, Father? I'll vote with the congregation. But which candidate do you prefer? It doesn't matter. This Congress will decide the future of the country. I'd say it matters a great deal. They're both fine Virginia men. The papers say Mr. Madison does not believe in religious liberty. I highly doubt that. They also say he's in favor of a tax to support the Episcopal Church. Mr. Madison is a fine man. Mr. Madison is a Federalist. Mr. Monroe stood against the Federalists from the beginning. They're both good candidates. They both make Virginia proud in the Congress. I, I don't know how you can say that. Madison wants another monarchy. Look at me, son. Culpeper County will likely decide this election for Virginia, but only if we vote as one. My personal preferences don't matter as much as the will of the congregation. I will vote with my fellow brethren, and so will you. You understand? Yes, Father. Just then, the white double doors to the church swing open. The fiddler stops playing as a hush falls over the crowd. James Madison and James Monroe walk outside and meet on the steps of the church. As they shake hands, the young man notices the contrast in their physical appearance. Madison short and frail. Monroe, tall and muscular. The boy leans over and whispers to his father. Look how slight Madison is. If a gust of wind blows there, he'll likely topple over. Hush. Monroe takes a step back and gives Madison the floor. Madison clears his throat and begins. My fellow Virginians, I'm here today to vindicate myself against the erroneous reports being propagated against me. It has been said that I am dogmatically attached to the Constitution in every clause, syllable, and letter. And therefore, not a single amendment will be promoted by my vote, either from conviction or a spirit of accommodation. But I assure you, the good people of Culpeper County, this is simply not true. Freedom of religion must be safeguarded by a constitutional amendment. If elected to serve in the house of the people, I will do everything in my power to protect your freedoms. The father nudges his son and smirks. Do you see? Don't believe everything you read. From Airship, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Elections Wicked Game. In the congressional election of 1789, two founding fathers and two future presidents faced off to debate the fate of the newly adopted U.S. Constitution and to decide which of them would be among the first elected members of the House of Representatives. Monroe opposed the ratification of the Constitution. Madison supported it. But in spite of their political differences, the two Virginians remained friends. On the campaign trail in 1789, they traveled together, campaign side by side and maintained a high level of decorum and respect. Madison was expected to lose the election to Monroe, but his performance at the debate in front of the Hebron Lutheran Church turned the tide in his favor. When the votes were tallied in February of 1789, Madison was victorious, 1,308 to 972. 
It's true that Madison sided with the Federalists in his early political years, but by the time he ran for president in 1808, his views had evolved. Madison, who served as President Jefferson's Secretary of State, became one of the leaders of the Anti-Federalist Party, the Democratic Republicans, or as they often called themselves, the Republicans. During Jefferson's tenure in the White House, Madison's views evolved again as he took on a more moderate posture. As Jefferson and Madison began to move away from the more constitutionally conservative faction of their party, the Republicans began to splinter. The conservatives turned their back on Jefferson and his supposed heir apparent James Madison. Their new political faction, called the Tertium Quids, wanted a change in Washington. To find it, the Quids, also known as the Old Republicans, looked to the very man who stood against Madison in the congressional election of 1789, James Monroe. This is Episode 6, 1808, Two Virginians. It's December 21st, 1805, in a meeting chamber in the House of Representatives in Washington. As the members of the House Ways and Means Committee begin to assemble, Treasury Secretary Albert Gallatin paces nervously, a piece of paper in his hands. He's waiting for a very important man, a politician who controls Congress's purse strings and wields a considerable amount of political influence, Committee Chairman John Randolph of Roanoke, Virginia, the de facto leader of the old Republicans in Congress. As Randolph strides into the hall, Gallatin gets to the business at hand. Mr. Randolph, may I have a moment? Provided this brief, Mr. Gallatin, I am quite busy. From the President, sir. Randolph's eyes quickly scan the document titled, Provision for the Purchase of Florida. His eyes flash red. As you know, Mr. Randolph, Spain refuses to cede West Florida as part of the Louisiana Purchase. The French have gone back on their word to help us in the negotiations, too. We've already paid for the Floridas. You would have us pay twice? It's not that simple, sir. The entire transaction was a usurpation of the Constitution to begin with. When I last checked, Mr. Gallatin, the Republicans are the party of the Constitution. My answer is no. France will not permit Spain to adjust her differences with us. France wants money. We must give it to her. Or else run the risk of a two-front war with Spain and France. If France knows she can extort money from us, she will never stop. Mr. Randolph, the President only desires that you... That I what? Do his bidding? No, sir. The president does not wish to force anything on you. He prefers to leave the particulars of the appropriations to the discretion of Congress. The particulars. Tell President Jefferson that I will not vote a shilling. Mr. Randolph, frankly, sir, I'm disgusted with the whole affair. I said as much to Secretary Madison. I've done everything in my power to cover the character of this administration. Now the president wishes me to act as if Congress has no character at all. Mr. Randolph, please, not to mention, I have my own character to cover and certain principles to consider. Congress is not a tool for the executive branch, sir. Tell the president this scheme of his will never make it out of my committee, never. Good day. As Randolph heads to his place at the head of the dais, Gallatin calls out. I thought you were a friend to Jefferson. I am, sir, though I'm afraid I must disappoint him. I am not calculated for a politician. Thomas Jefferson had won the election of 1804 in a landslide, thanks in part to the popularity of the Louisiana Purchase. Jefferson had secured the Louisiana Territory from France and doubled the size of the country without firing a single shot. But Jefferson's detractors claimed he had overstepped his presidential authority and undermined the Constitution. For many Republicans, especially in the South, Jefferson had abandoned his pro-states' rights principles. In their minds, Jefferson had become no better than a Federalist. Jefferson's actions during his first term, though popular with the people, had caused a rift within his own party. This divide gave rise to what is arguably the first third-party movement in American political history. This group of disaffected Republicans, led by John Randolph, would become called the Tertium Quids, a Latin phrase meaning a third option. The Quid movement was largely comprised of the conservative, landholding aristocracy in the South, men like John Randolph. The Quids advocated an extreme states' rights philosophy of government. They adhered to the strictest interpretation of the Constitution and abhorred the centralizing tendencies of the Federalists and certain sects of their own party. Thomas Jefferson had made known his intention not to seek a third term as early as 1804. For Jefferson, and for many Republicans, Secretary of State James Madison was the heir apparent, but the Quid saw it a different way. In a letter to Treasury Secretary Gallatin in October of 1805, 
Randolph had written, I regret exceedingly Mr. Jefferson's resolution to retire. If I were sure that Monroe would succeed him, my regret would be very much diminished. In December of 1805, James Monroe was in London, serving as the U.S. Minister to Great Britain. He had earned a reputation as a skilled diplomat, having spent time in Spain, France, and England, negotiating on behalf of the U.S., and he had played a central role in the Louisiana Purchase. But the task before Monroe in London was a colossal one. For over a decade, France and England had been in a nearly constant state of war. The U.S. had adopted a policy of neutrality, but as the years went on, it became exceedingly more difficult to stay out of the conflict. By December of 1805, Napoleon's army was dominating on land, but the British still ruled the seas. Napoleon's strategy for winning the war was to blockade the European coast and starve out the Brits. The British fought back, seizing ships and impressing into service every English-speaking man that had the remotest possibility of being a British citizen, even if they were actually Americans. To quote one British officer, they were after any likely-looking lad who had the slightest trace of an Irish or British accent. Between 1793 and 1812, the British impressed into their service as many as 15,000 U.S. sailors. In fighting for America's interests, Monroe faced enormous opposition in London. He and his family were snubbed socially. The British Foreign Office barely acknowledged him. French diplomats and authorities in Europe also largely ignored him. Monroe was getting nowhere. So in late January 1806, Secretary of State Madison stood before Congress and asked them to take action. Congress responded by passing the first Non-Importation Act, banning imports of British goods that the U.S. could produce at home or get from other countries. Congress, fed up by the lack of progress, also demanded Jefferson replace James Monroe with a new minister. Jefferson tapped Republican William Pinckney of Maryland for the job. But before Jefferson or Madison had a chance to write Monroe and give him advance notice, the story leaked and appeared in a London newspaper. Monroe was furious. He saw Pinckney's appointment as a public repudiation by two of his closest political allies and friends. Monroe had hoped to leave Europe with a peace treaty under his belt. Jefferson and Madison made that personal triumph impossible. After reading the article in the paper, Monroe wrote to Madison in February of 1806, I desire nothing but simple justice. Where two or more commissioners are appointed at the same time, the trust injures none, but reflects honor on them all. My hope, therefore, was that if any person was appointed to succeed me, or any new modification of trust made, that it would not be done until after my return to the United States, or it was known that I had actually sailed. I wish my conduct here to rest on its own ground, that nothing may be left to insinuation for my enemies to misrepresent and my friends to explain. Monroe never received a response from Madison. Pinckney was already sailing for London by the time Monroe's letter arrived. It was too late. To many in Congress, especially the tertium quids, Jefferson's appointment of Pinckney was seen as a political maneuver to undermine Monroe's presidential prospects and to prop up James Madison. In March 1806, John Randolph, the leader of the quids, wrote to Monroe stating that the sole object of the Jefferson administration is to raise Mr. Madison to the presidency. To this, the old Republican Party will never consent. Between them and the supporters of Mr. Madison, there is an open rupture. Need I tell you that they are united in your support? That they look to you, sir? Your country requires, nay, demands your presence. If Monroe was ambitious, he was also loyal. In June of 1806, Monroe replied to John Randolph, stating that he did not want to run the risk of promoting the success of the opposite party, which I should deem ruinous to the cause. Monroe went on, I feel with gratitude and sensibility the confidence which you and other friends repose in me. I feel proud also in a belief that I shall do nothing hereafter to forfeit this good opinion. There are older men, whom I have long been accustomed to consider as having higher pretensions to the trust than myself, whose claims it would be painful to me to see rejected. The older man he speaks of is, of course, his longtime friend, James Madison. Financial concerns also influenced Monroe's reluctance to stand for president. His plantation in Virginia was bleeding money. Every day he spent in politics was costing him his fortune. Monroe resolved to focus his efforts on finishing his work before returning home to tend to his commercial affairs. During his time in London, Monroe and Pinckney would, in part, achieve their goal. 
On December 31st, 1806, after months of negotiations, Monroe and Pinckney together signed what would come to be called the Monroe-Pinckney Treaty. It was far from perfect. The British didn't budge on the question of impressment of American sailors, and they refused to compensate the U.S. for seized ships and cargo. But the British had made one major concession. They agreed to protect American merchant ships sailing along routes between the U.S. and Great Britain. But when news of the treaty reached Washington in March of 1807, Jefferson threatened to reject the treaty without ever showing it to the Senate. His Secretary of State, James Madison, warned him against it arguing that the British government would see it as an act of hostility. Madison saw another potential unintended consequence of Jefferson's threat. If Jefferson rejected the treaty outright, it would be seen as a disavowment of his own diplomats. As one Republican senator wrote, Monroe will be called a martyr, and the martyr will be president. And why? Because he has done right, and his opponent has advised wrong. So instead, Jefferson ordered Madison to instruct Monroe and Pinckney to quietly kill the agreement. In May of 1807, Jefferson wrote to Monroe, hoping to soften the blow and repair the rift between them. I had intended to have written you to counteract the wicked efforts which the federal papers are making to sow tares between you and me, but I've not done it. Delicacy would prevent me from ever expressing a sentiment on the subject. I think you know me well enough to be assured I shall conscientiously observe the line of conduct I profess. I shall receive you on your return with the warm affection I have ever entertained for you and be gratified if I can in any way avail the public of your services. In May of 1807, Monroe wasn't thinking about public service. His immediate plan was to finish his work overseas, return home to his plantation, start a career as a lawyer, and for the moment, leave politics behind. Events on the world stage, however, would disrupt Monroe's plans. In the summer of 1807, a bloody battle on the high seas would challenge U.S. neutrality in the ongoing conflict between France and England. The Chesapeake Leopard Affair, as it would come to be known, would bring the simmering tension between the U.S. and Britain to a boiling point, and it would thrust Monroe back into politics and deeper into the growing turmoil churning inside the Republican Party. It's June 22nd, 1807, at 3 o'clock p.m., about three leagues off the coast of Norfolk, Virginia. Two naval ships, a British warship and an American frigate, are halted side by side within hailing distance. On the deck of the American ship, the USS Chesapeake, stands American naval captain James Barron. Across from him stands a British messenger, a parcel in his hands. Watching from the deck of the British warship, the HMS Leopard, is the British ranking officer, Captain Humphreys. The messenger bows and hands the U.S. captain a letter. From Captain Humphreys of the HMS Leopard, he has dispatches from his commander, the Commodore of the British fleet. And what does the Honorable Captain Humphreys desire? You have on board four sailors, four deserters, who belong to Her Majesty's Navy. You are to surrender all four men, or he shall have no choice but to search your ship. Aaron's eyes quickly scan the document for the four names. Hmm, I know no such men as you describe. As you well know, the U.S. government forbids the recruitment of deserters from His Britannic Majesty's ships. I assure you, these men are not on board the Chesapeake. But it's a lie. The four men in question might be British deserters, but they're his men now. And there's no chance he's giving them up. I assure you, sir, these men are in your possession. I am instructed never to permit the crew of any ship that I command to be mustered by any other but their own officers. It is my disposition to preserve harmony and I hope this answer to your dispatch will prove satisfactory. Mm. I shall relay your message, sir. Baron knows his answer will not be satisfactory, but as he looks around the deck of his ship, he also knows the Chesapeake is outgunned against the Leopard. Captain Baron's first lieutenant steps forward. Your orders, Captain Baron? Clear the gun decks, beat to quarters, and prepare to engage. Yes, sir. Just then, the British captain calls out from across the water. Captain Baron, I do hope you are well, sir. Baron walks slowly to the edge of the ship and calls back. And I you, Captain Humphreys. I see you've ordered your men to battle positions. As have you, sir. I do not see a need for bloodshed today, Captain. Will you permit me to search your vessel? I will not, sir. You must be aware, sir, of the necessity I am under complying with my orders of my commander-in-chief. 
I am under orders as well, as you also must be aware. I cannot allow it. Humphreys turns his back on Baron and calls out at the top of his lungs, Fire! The British fire a warning shot right across the Chesapeake's bow. The next shot will not be a miss, Captain Baron. Will you let me aboard the vessel? You have my answer. So be it fire at will. On the afternoon of June 22, 1807, the British warship, the HMS Leopard, unloaded cannon fire on the USS Chesapeake. Eighteen Americans were wounded. Three were killed. The incident, which would come to be known as the Chesapeake Leopard Affair, would push the U.S. to the brink of all-out war. The affair outraged the American people. In the eyes of many Americans, the British were treating America like the Revolutionary War had never happened. On July 10, 1807, Jefferson wrote, this country has never been in such a state of excitement since the Battle of Lexington. Jefferson responded swiftly by issuing a proclamation ordering all British ships out of U.S. waters. His Secretary of State, James Madison, responded by recalling the U.S. minister to England, his old friend James Monroe. By the time Monroe returned to the U.S. in mid-December of 1807, Jefferson had already gone to Congress asking them to retaliate against the British with an embargo closing American imports to all foreign trade. The Embargo Act of 1807 was signed into law by President Jefferson on December 22nd. By all accounts, it was an instant disaster. Almost immediately, U.S. ships on foreign waters were raided by the French and the British alike, not to mention rogue pirates. France seized about $10 million worth of American ships and cargo. American exports dropped from $108 million in 1807 to $22.5 million in 1808, a fall of over 75%. Imports fell from $16 million to just a few thousand dollars. Over 50,000 sailors were marooned and 100,000 Americans, from merchants to craftsmen to laborers, were left without work. And for the quids in Congress, the Embargo Act of 1807 only strengthened their resolve that it was time for a change in Washington. After arriving in Norfolk, Virginia in mid-December 1807, James Monroe headed straight to Richmond. There, he was bombarded by letters and visits from a host of political leaders, including John Randolph, the leader of the Quids. Randolph laid out for Monroe his plans to launch a full-scale presidential campaign on his behalf. Monroe did not officially respond to Randolph's overtures. He wanted to talk to Jefferson first. Ten days after landing on U.S. soil, Monroe arrived in Washington. He was personally greeted by his two longtime friends. In their conversation at the White House, Jefferson and Madison were overly polite. Monroe attempted to discuss the situation with Great Britain, but Jefferson and Madison sidestepped the issue. They didn't talk politics or foreign affairs. They didn't discuss Monroe's efforts overseas or why his treaty was scuttled. And perhaps most devastating to Monroe, even though he longed to retire to his plantation, they didn't mention Monroe's political future at all. Monroe was heartbroken. He'd come to Washington determined to remain loyal to the president and deferential to James Madison. He left Washington determined to do just the opposite. In keeping with the norms of the day, Monroe would not openly campaign, but he agreed to let his friends put him forward as a candidate for the regular party nomination. And the clock was ticking. Both the state and national caucus meetings were set to take place in January 1808, just a few weeks away. The fight for Monroe's nomination largely took place in two arenas, Washington and Virginia. The National Congressional Caucus was held in Washington on January 23, 1808. Out of the 89 votes cast, Madison earned 83. Monroe received only three. But the numbers were deceiving. 79 congressmen had not attended, which left plenty of states up for grabs. Among those absents were a slate of pro-Monroe Republicans, including John Randolph of Virginia. And in Virginia, pro-Madison supporters did not wait for the results from Washington. They held a private caucus of their own at a local tavern and excluded Monroe's supporters from attending. There, 124 Republicans voted to nominate Madison. But Monroe's supporters held their own caucus in the state capitol on the same day. Monroe won that nomination by a vote of 57 to 10. Madison might have been the clear frontrunner, but Monroe was in the race. In February 1808, Jefferson wrote to Monroe, Some of your new friends are attacking your old ones out of friendship for you, 
but in a way to render you great injury. I see with infinite grief a contest arising between yourself and another who have been very dear to each other, and equally so to me. That same month, Monroe responded to Jefferson. He explained that in keeping with precedent, he would not openly campaign or attack Madison. But should the nation be disposed to call any citizen to that station, it would be his duty to accept it. On that ground, I rest. On March 10th, 1808, Jefferson responded to Monroe's letter with an apology regarding the Monroe-Pinckney Treaty. I never lost sight of your reputation and favorable standing with your country, and never omitted to justify your failure to attain our wish as one which was probably unattainable. On March 22nd, 1808, Monroe responded. On the subject of Pinckney's appointment, he maintained, I should have been the first to hear of it in a private letter from yourself or Mr. Madison. But he accepted Jefferson's explanation and his apology. To do you an injury never entered my mind. For a while, I labored under a conviction, not only that I had been injured, but that the friendly feelings which you had so long entertained for me had ceased to exist. The only sentiment in which I indulged was that of sorrow. At present, I am happy to say that all doubt of your friendship towards me having experienced any change is completely done away. Monroe made nice with Jefferson, but not with Madison. After their meeting in December of 1807, the two men would not speak or correspond for years. Ultimately, Monroe would withdraw from the race just two weeks away from the start of the election process. Monroe's candidacy was less about winning the presidency and more about proving a point. He wanted to demonstrate that he had the support, loyalty, and confidence of many in his party, even if he didn't have it from Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Because if Monroe had truly wanted to defeat James Madison, he would have likely thrown his support behind another Republican, former New York Governor George Clinton. When the Republican National Caucus met in January of 1808, they had voted to nominate Clinton as Madison's vice president. But there was a problem. Clinton did not want the job. In the spring of 1808, George Clinton was nearly 70 years old. He had already served as Jefferson's vice president, replacing the disgraced Aaron Burr in the election of 1804. So Clinton had his sights set on higher office, and he was running out of time. After learning of his nomination, Clinton did something extraordinary. He protested that he did not want his name put forward that no one had ever told him he was being considered. He claimed that he did not approve his nomination for vice president, but he did not withdraw either. In March of 1808, he kept the vice presidential nomination in his back pocket and announced his candidacy for president of the United States. Perhaps it was a clever ploy, or perhaps Mr. Clinton was showing signs of decline. As one senator described him, he is old, feeble, and altogether incapable of the duty of presiding in the Senate. He has no mind, no intellect, no memory. He forgets the question, mistakes it, and not infrequently declares a vote before it's taken, and often forgets to do it after it's taken. Still, Clinton enjoyed broad support in New England, especially in his home state of New York. And even though a Clinton presidency was a long shot, his popularity in New York made him a serious candidate. But Clinton supporters knew his age and feebleness was a vulnerability. So they went on the attack, lambasting Madison's health in the press. In one New York paper called the Farmer's Register, a Clinton supporter wrote that while Madison was a little younger than George Clinton, he is sickly, valtudinarian, and subject to spasmodic affections. The phrase spasmodic affections might sound unusual, but to a New York audience in the 1800s, the meaning was crystal clear. That phrase called to mind hysteria, commonly thought of as a feminine condition. The implication was not only was Madison weak, he was womanly too. And Madison's political foes didn't stop at insulting his character. They went after his marriage too, in large part because Madison was wed to a force of nature named Dolly Madison. As is often the case in American politics, a strong political force is met with a strong political resistance. And in the eyes of Madison's political enemies, Dolly was as much a threat as her husband, perhaps even more so. James Madison was not a powerful orator. Though he was a deep thinker and an intellectual, he was soft-spoken, reserved, and physically unassuming. His wife Dolly, on the other hand, was witty, gregarious, and charming. 
A friend once described her as a foe to dullness in every form. In the 1800s, presidents did not openly campaign. But Dolly understood that a campaign of another sort could be waged behind closed doors, under the auspices of a good party. In the 1808 contest, the Madison House on F Street became ground zero for Madison's unofficial campaign. Dolly hosted soirees, wined and dined the who's who of Washington, and used her charm to gin up support for her husband. She made quite an impression. In the spring of 1808, Dr. Samuel Mitchell, a prominent senator from New York, wrote to his wife, Mrs. Madison has the bright prospect of becoming Lady Presidentress. But Dolly did more than play the hostess. She gave her husband advice. She played the part of political informant. She wrote letters and took meetings on his behalf when he was ill. She was the political force Madison's enemies were afraid to reckon with. So in the spring of 1808, newspapers began circulating lewd rumors about her. Rumors that Dolly had previously had an affair with Thomas Jefferson. That her husband was impotent that he had prostituted Dolly to Republicans in exchange for political favors. In 1808, Senator Mitchell wrote again to his wife, Your friend Mrs. Madison is shockingly and unfeelingly traduced in the Virginia papers. John Randolph, the leader of the Quids, was, at least in part, the source of these rumors. He'd been dragging Dolly through the mud for years. He had once written to James Monroe, You, my dear sir, cannot be ignorant how deeply the respectability of any character may be impaired by an unfortunate matrimonial connection. Reportedly, Randolph once said he could make a congressman's hair stand as erect as the quills on a porcupine with evidence of the sexual insatiability of a certain Republican woman, leader of the flock. But if the rumor mill took a toll on Dolly, she never let on. When asked about the rumors, she told a friend, oh, whenever people say things like that to you, the thing to do is just smile. James and Dolly never publicly responded to the allegations against them. They took the high road. But the 1808 contest was not primarily about Dolly. It was about her husband's support of the embargo of 1807, an issue that would define the 1808 contest and give a shot of life to the rudderless opposition, the Federalists. It's June 1808 at a meeting hall in Boston. The members of the Federalist Party's Committee of Correspondence gather around a table Cigars in hand, papers and letters scattered on the tabletop. This small group of men are lawyers and former congressmen, some of the most influential figures in the Federalist Party. They've been appointed by their colleagues for one task, to coordinate the Federalist effort to win the election of 1808. Two of the members are locked in a heated debate, former Congressman Harris Otis and former U.S. Attorney Christopher Gore. Mr. Otis, this is a question of principle. Shall principle trump expediency, Mr. Gore? They are not mutually exclusive, Electoral calculations might beg to differ. We should put forward our strongest names, Mr. Pinckney from South Carolina and Mr. King from New York. We put them forward in 1808, and look where that got us. Now, that was four years ago. The party was still reeling from Mr. Hamilton's death. We are far better organized today, more organized than our friends across the aisle. The Republicans are united behind Madison. Mr. Gore, I stand by the principles of the Federalist Party, and I would happily stand by Mr. King or Mr. Pinckney if they possess even the smallest probability of success, but they don't. The coalition with our rivals in New York is the only path forward. (coughs) You would tether the Federalist Party to George Clinton? He's no better than Madison. The people are suffering, Mr. Gore. Clinton would free us from the shackles of this embargo. Clinton is no friend to the Federalists. He will strike a bargain with us. He will promise to reverse the policy of Thomas Jefferson in exchange for our support. (sighs) Suppose you're right. Will Clinton bring enough votes to carry the election? Well, he will win New York, Mr. Gore. 19 electoral votes are worth the price of abandoning our principles. If he can win New York, he can win Pennsylvania. And if that happens, we'll have a fighting chance. (sighs) The party will never unite behind George Clinton. We must rally our friends towards a common purpose. Unity is what matters most. Unity. What are you suggesting, Mr. Otis? I propose a meeting of Federalists in New York, from as many states as possible at the first opportunity. Otis leans in to drive home the most important point of all. We must go together, gentlemen, or we will fall apart. In the election of 1804, Republicans had swept the presidency, the House, and the Senate, thanks to superior party organization on the state and national level. In the 1808 contest, Federalists would try to take a page out of that Republican playbook.
At the meeting in June of 1808, the Committee of Correspondence proposed what was arguably the first national nominating convention in American political history. It was a radical idea. Republicans had already developed a sophisticated nominating process, but it was largely driven by the states. In previous elections, Republican congressmen had met in a national caucus and made nominations, but ultimately the states were the driving force behind choosing the nominees. The states were independent and difficult to control. Still, the brand of national organization that Otis was suggesting was largely viewed by Federalists with contempt. It was seen as revolutionary, despotic, and even illegal. But in the summer of 1808, the Federalists performed an about-face. In August 1808, in New York City, the Federalist Party held a secret national convention. They went to great lengths to conceal it from the public. There are no records of what the nomination process looked like. All that's known is the result. Ultimately, the Federalists refused to partner with the Clintonians. At the convention, they nominated the same ticket they had run in 1804, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney of South Carolina for president, Senator Rufus King of New York for vice president. And despite their best efforts, word of the convention did get out in the Republican press. On August 22nd, Boston's Independent Chronicle reported that the Federalist Convention was designed to appoint a king to rule over us. But in spite of public pushback, the Federalists launched a coordinated nationwide anti-embargo campaign, which featured a cartoon mascot named Oh Grab Me, embargo spelled backwards. In one prominent political cartoon, O'Grabney was drawn taking a bite out of a merchant's rear end, and other Federalists accused Jefferson and Madison of kowtowing to the French and trying to incite war with Britain. In response, Jefferson released thousands of pages of diplomatic letters, many of which were written by Madison. The heir apparent was vindicated. The national intelligencer called his morals irreproachable. Madison and Jefferson never backed off their support for the embargo. Instead, Madison banked his political future on the idea that Americans would prefer a temporary economic setback over an all-out war. In the end, his gamble would pay off. The presidential electors from each of the 17 states voted on December 7, 1808. Madison received 122 votes to Pinckney's 47. George Clinton received only six. He would settle for the vice presidency. After the election, Pinckney would write, I was beaten by Mr. and Mrs. Madison. I might have had a better chance if I faced Mr. Madison alone. Madison's inaugural celebration, coordinated by his wife Dolly, was held at Long's Hotel on Capitol Hill in early March 1809. Over 400 guests attended. A band played Madison's March as James and Dolly entered the hall. James wore simple black attire. Dolly, a pale velvet dress with a long train, a pearl necklace, a bracelet, and earrings. The elegant, charming Quaker girl, turned presidentress of Washington, was the talk of the ball. As one observer noted, she looked and moved like a queen. The party was a merry affair, and it made history, too. It was the first inaugural ball in U.S. history, a tradition that is still practiced today. The celebration in Washington, though, would be short-lived. Not long after his inauguration, Madison's cousin wrote to him, You will indeed, I fear, have a stormy time to encounter. At the outset of Madison's presidency, Americans were still resentful of the Chesapeake Leopard affair, and even more resentful of the government's response. Throughout his two terms as president, Jefferson had maintained neutrality with Britain and France. During his first term, Madison would attempt to do the same. But in the year 1812, with the dogs of war howling outside America's gates, Madison would have no choice but to defend his country and his prospects for a second term. This is Episode 6 of American Elections Wicked Game, 1808, Two Virginians. On the next episode, the election of 1812, Madison grapples with the question of war with Great Britain. His decision will define the upcoming election and the course of world history. This episode contains reenactments and dramatized details. And while in most cases we can't know exactly what was said, all our dramatizations are based on historical research. American Elections Wicked Game is an airship production. Hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham. Sound designed by Derek Behrens. Music by Lindsey Graham. Co-executive produced by Stephen Walters in association with Ritual Productions. Written and researched by Stephen Walters. 
Fact-checking by Greg Jackson and C.L. Salazar from the podcast History That Doesn't Suck.